I've heard Jonathan Kozel and I've heard Warren Buffett say the same thing. If you wanted to fix public education in America, the fastest way to do it is make private schools illegal. Now think about that. If uh, you know, the mayor of the city had to send their kids to Locke High School, or Arnold Schwarzenegger had to send their kids to Locke High School, you know how fast the school would change? The good news is we know it works, and how do you find the levers to change it? And that's really, that's really the game. Green Dot is a uh, collective of charter schools. We are a mini school system, a nonprofit school system, of public schools in the highest senior areas of Los Angeles. Our mission is pretty simple. I want to just change the whole system, not just create a bunch of charter schools. And, and in fact, charter schools are, in my mind, nothing more than good R&D. You know, what a school district could look like. This school was responsive to the Watts riots in 1965. What ended up happening was all the schools in the surrounding area, Washington Prep, Jordan, uh, Fremont, they sent the toughest kids to the school. The Bloods and the Crips first started within three blocks of the school. This is a school, and there's no way to sugarcoat it, where a lot of teachers come to play out their contracts. A lot of teachers come to hide. There was this one teacher here last year, I was told was drunk for 20 years. In this time of day, you would walk across the school and there would be kids everywhere. Middle class, these are gonna be fights, you could smell pot, people playing craps. It was wild. There are 11 and 12 graders on this campus who don't have any credits. They've been walking around for three years pretending to be students, but no credits. You know, I used to mentor kids at Jordan down the street here, another Watts High School. Uh, East LA, I went to Roosevelt and Garfield High School. And the first thing I noticed is like, these schools really look like prisons. I mean, really, I mean, they have barbed wire around them. The kids are on top of each other. Uh, they, they, the, the adults communicate by, you know, by alarms and the kids are herded in and out. And so that's what I re realized right away. And the two groups of people that really were getting screwed by the process were, the teachers had very little power. It was very hard to find a teacher. They didn't have their own classrooms, they shared classrooms. Uh, and then parents, you'd walk into the front office and then you know, people don't even look up at them, you know, let alone, you know, see them as the, who we're serving. And then the kids are obviously just getting pushed through the system. And so I was looking at what, what, what a model would look like for a good urban high school. What I ended up doing, I said, I said what does $25,000 get you in Los Angeles? What is, if you're, a, if you're a, a big movie star or an athlete, what, what, is, your, what is the school you, what is the school that looks like that you send your kid to? So I went to uh, Crossroads and Harvard Westlake and uh, Brentwood School and some of the Tonia schools in Los Angeles, and they all had kind of the same kind of basic characteristics. One, they were small. You would never send your kid to a 20, for $25,000 a year to a school that had 3,000 kids in it or 2,000 kids or 1,000 kids. You'd have, you'd have three or four or 500. Why? Because you don't want your kids to fall through the cracks, right? For 25 grand, you would never spend that on a school that had, had mixed expectations based on skin color or shyness. We'd have high expectations for all kids. And if my kid's behind, get them up to speed. That's why I'm paying 25 grand, right? So you'd have high expectations. Small school, high expectations. The third thing is you would never spend 25 grand on a private school that half the money didn't get to the school. It was, it was, it was, there was some carved out, you know, deal and, and it went to some office downtown. You'd want it all in the school to pay the, to have the best teachers and the best tools and the best facilities, right? So you'd want all the dollars at the school site and as a parent, if I had a problem with the school, I should be able to call the school and get a response right away, not find a voicemail or have indifference. You know, you get a call back right away for 25 grand a year. And I want to be part of the school, I want to do bake sales and come, you know, volunteer and raise money and do all the things that you would do in a school setting. So if that works, small, high expectations, money and decisions at school sites, and parents, you're accountable to them, and they're also your partners. If that works in rich kids' schools, why, why do we still build public schools that look like prisons? This is the first time we've inherited a whole school and the property. So we did some physical stuff. 
We painted the whole place. We cleaned the whole place. This center area here was paid for anonymously by um, a famous actress, that, and she brought in all these trees. So it looked like a place that, you know, you want, it looked like a little university. We went out and raised some money and found a lot of great principals and they had a year to plan it. We had 120 teachers here, 40 of them returned. And we replaced the other 80 with people that believe the kids can learn. So everywhere they go, there's somebody in front of them that believes in them. Well, that's a big difference. That's, that's, you can't change the school unless you do that. There's no teacher shortage in this country. There's a work condition problem. When I started Green Dot, we started our own teacher union, which really, in the, as far as the charter movement looked at me, most of them just thought I was a clown. <laughs> we don't count minutes and hours in a work day. It's a professional work day. It's mutually agreed upon by the stakeholders at that school site. No tenure, but just cause. Hiring and firing is done at that site with cause. You know, and so you can't just fire somebody willy-nilly or the test scores are down and I'm looking for a scapegoat. You have to prove, we didn't, you know, did you give them enough coaching, enough development? Is it just the teacher's fault? And, and back and forth, and that's, I think, it's a healthy thing. A lot of Green Dot was built on the idea of the eyes of a 15-year-old boy, which I, I'll never hopefully lose that memory. When you're 15 years old, your, your BS meter is so finely tuned. You know when people think you're second class. You know when people think you can't learn. When people don't even explain to you why you're learning something or why you do things at school, you're going to question that. I went to a high school in California when we were the number one funded schools in the country. I was, you know, charismatic and loud and that school was built for me. I had a little pudgy brother named Michael who wasn't in the, in the sports. He wasn't uh, outgoing. He ended up dropping out. And our lives, we were both raised by a single mom who was a waitress, but our lives started going this way at that point in life. When I was 30, my young brother died a drug overdose. My brother would do really well in this school because the teachers would get to know something unique about him. Not just uh, the loud kids, not just the popular kids, not just the athletes. That's a very big part of what we're trying to do here. I mean, that's, every one of these kids have value. Every one of them. Hey, fellas. Is that part of your ROTC? Flashing that stuff? Come on. <laughs> hey, pull your pants up, will you? But you're never going to get kids to fulfill their potential by dumbing down to them or talking down to them. And also what you have going on here, which people, which is really the bigger story about Los Angeles and Urban Core is that you have a lot of first generation new Americans who, if you think about um, uh, our own immigrant stories, your immigrant stories, my immigrant stories, that first generation works three times harder. You know, And so what you end up having, you have a population of kids that if you actually lift the bar high and you feed them, they'll work their tails off. And the African American families do the same thing. You know, they want to overcome. We actually ask parents to be involved at 30 hours, recommended a year. But we make that participation worthwhile. And they love, they love to be involved and they love the ownership of it. You know? And so you know, parents thrive on, uh, on being involved, but, but something that's meaningful, not a waste of time. You know? They want to see their kids succeed. They want to be involved. You know? Some of them are afraid of schools because school wasn't good to them. You know, we, so we're, you know, this will become more of a community school where we'll do adult literacy and that kind of thing and, welcome, and try to make it a welcoming place. When we liberated this school, when we took the school from the school district and acting no child left behind, we took $26 million away from the school district. That hurt. And we took 150 members from the United Teachers of Los Angeles, Teachers Union. That hurts. But more importantly, across the city, other schools woke up and said, we want to do that. And we're going to go out and stoke that demand. We're not going to just stoke the demand with the teachers, but also with the parents. The real goal is to organize yourself out of a job and have LAUSD look just like Green Dot. I've been able to develop a team that actually can run the school as well as anybody. Now my job is to figure out how do you take that success and, 
take it to the next level.